بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن كل سؤال وهذا برنامج رنتي أنا ما لين يضد بدنيني كيف هذا يصندونا وحوينا برشدين أو تريدونا مرك الله يجو حين ما أنت كهلا إنه عارين آد يآد مهمة أو very important all the community عدك ستا مرك فضلا هدي أذكر إني صدت كنيبرك كووكر أما قف كل الشقاء ينيبرك أنت ب فضلا تي في جن حسوسي برنامج كنا كهلا إنه هو برنامج رنتي آد وحيس بدن ما دام إنه هاي سومالي أمريكا كون نول ستيت أوف واشنطن كين كاونو إيريا يستيت كبا وحن شاء الله ما أنت هذا من أن ينتبهوا لدي كوسا مايو وحن نشوفنا University of Washington أو برنامج كنا نكسر دينه إنه قريب وين نكا إيريس أو الله جه هذا دونه بل سيدا أوسا مايو وما دا سومالي يا دو كوميونيتي بدنا يهلكم كتير مركب وحن شاء الله the first question إنه ينتبهوا لدي كوسا مايو مشال شيء سرني next to me welcome to Somali TV thank you for having me and give us a little bit about your background mm -hmm. what you do what is this show about okay uh, uh, well, I am uh, a clinical health psychologist. Mm -hmm. I am a core faculty for the Center for AIDS Research at the University of Washington and also an acting assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Medicine at the mm -hmm. University of Washington. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> so this project ha is um, a project that we've been working on for three years. Okay. And we've been working with local African-born leaders and local African-American leaders, uh, community members, and community-based organizations because there are disparities it, that exist in the African-born and African-American community here in King County that we know that our community doesn't yes. know about. So we wanted to get the information out there that HIV is impacting the black community here in King County and also talk about concurrency, which is one of the factors that uh, leads to transmission or increases transmission of HIV in our community. So you're just trying to tell all the Somalian, wherever they are, state of Washington, trying to tell them, warning them what's is, what mm -hmm. to do and how the, all this disease come through. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you know any Somalian have HIV or any AIDS so far in state of Washington? I do. I know a few who are HIV positive and actually in 2009, 18 Somalis were tested uh, as HIV positive, so they made up Somali 18 in the state of Washington, in the state right, of Washington here right here where we are, were tested positive, and so they make up about 1% of all of the black people here in, in, Washington. in Washington who are HIV positive, yes. Okay, that's very important to know. Well, I think it's very important to know Somali or HIV, I think it's very important to know that you have to know لقى عبس ده ولا جب بقول رنتي إن قف عاد جرني سامع إسلام عم قف في من بينا بينه كل عائلة سرنتي ووح عادي هذا نحدين بدن لكن وشديدا ما أنت هلك نوفر إنه مش شغل وحويا out region إن لقوس سامي عائلة كسيدو دي بكاني وهذا كيس النمبر كاي مرة يسوا before إن أنا وح بشرين بالجيا ما أنت النمبر كسومي thousand سومالي أم باكين كاونو أم ستيت أوف واشنطن كنول مركب for that reason مشغل she trying to explain everything and she's right here so what are you gonna, how are you going to explain to us? Well, I wanted to just talk to you about HIV in King County and in Washington State because a lot of African-born individuals and African-American individuals that we've spoken to, we held focus groups um, about three years ago, uh, three, two and a half years ago, where we spoke to the African-born community about HIV in the community. And many African-born individuals felt that HIV isn't a problem here in King County mm -hmm. and that it was only a problem in Africa. And actually, out of all of the ethnic and racial groups in King County, African Americans and African-born individuals are hardest hit by HIV. So we make up 4% of the, the population, population in Washington State. And yet, one in every five yeah. HIV cases are black. So that means 25 percent. Yes, will be exactly. And out of those people, 47 percent of all the black people who are HIV infected are African born. Now, the large majority of African born individuals. What do you mean by that when you're saying African born? That people came from Somalia, Ethiopia, yes. Kenya? Yes, yes, exactly. They, they didn't born here. That's yeah, they're at, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're from Africa, they were born in Africa, and now they're living here. So 47% of all of the black people in King County who test mm -hmm. HIV positive are born in Africa. Africa. 
So, and then the largest majority of them are Ethiopian and Kenyan. But as I told you mm. before, in 2009, mm. which mm. is the last year that we have data, okay. 18 Somali. Somalis tested HIV positive, and that's 1% of, of, that of yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, that case is like a sort of that can go bad and it could have been all keep for the seven to the way of certain what that can Africa could have shay a key with a mayor and a more in a key mad than I can count a read this I'm still watched on lady but Marco and Charlie had the fallen city on the Gisab and I'm just going to have a name channel money or more to my demo and more I can call only and وقت دار نسيت شو قلنا ده كقارنا كل شيء الله يعلم وقت اللي جت تجي إنتي اللي دقنان دونا بمركب فائدة أولى وحوي ينساتك أوجان دون تمر دام إنه الصومال أمريكا نهاي إن هذا جاتا ووح رنتي عن أوران كريا صحة سداد رادد أي أوت ريتش كوس من إنه دون إن إن لودجو أو وح عليه كنا أما سداد أولو عمركب وح نشعل مشال أي إكسبلين إنه كوس من دون توانا كنا Okay, well, thank you for having me here on Somali TV. I want to talk to you about a very important issue in the local black community. We have been working on a concurrency campaign for the past three years with local African-born and African-American community to get the word out to the community about how HIV is impacting our community and what we might be able to do to protect ourselves and to protect the people that we love and to protect our community and make sure that our community is healthy. So I'd like to show you a presentation and uh, hopefully this will let you know sort of how HIV is impacting uh, the black community here in Seattle. So this first slide shows HIV rates by race, gender, and foreign-born status in Washington State. And as you can see from the slide, this is from the years 2005 to 2009, African-born black men and African-born black women have higher rates of HIV than any other racial or ethnic group in Washington State. So what do those numbers mean? Out of 100,000 African-born individuals, 129 men are HIV positive. And for every 100,000 African-born women, 123 are HIV positive. So you can see that HIV in Seattle and King County is an issue for the African-born community. And one of the things that we found from talking to community members is that a lot of African-born individuals don't hear anything about HIV or uh, they move here from Africa and they don't see the billboards, they don't see it on TV. So they think that HIV isn't a problem here in the community. And it is actually a problem in the community. We, as black individuals, only make up 4% of the population in Washington state. And yet one out of every five HIV infections is a, a black person here in Washington state. And foreign born blacks, so that's African born blacks, make up about a third of all black people living with HIV statewide. And between the years of 2005 and 2009, non-Hispanic black people born outside the United States, so again, mostly African-born blacks, made up nearly half of all blacks, of all new HIV cases among blacks in Washington state. So this chart shows new cases of HIV among native and foreign-born black individuals. And you can see the light lines are African Americans and the dark lines are African born. And what I want to point out is that since 2000, the cases among African Americans have been going down. You can see they started at 132 cases a year and they've gone down to 100. But the cases among African born individuals continue to go up, starting at 81 cases. Uh, and when I say cases, I mean 81 people who were HIV infected between the year 2000 and 2001, all the way up to 96 cases in 2008, 2009. And you might be asking, well, 
why do they only have up to 2009? Well, this is the most recent data that the Department of Health has available. Um, so the 2010 and 2011 data are not available. And then if you look at, okay, so of these black individuals who are living with HIV in Washington State, who are they? And you can see that 64% of black individuals living with HIV in the United States um, are, or I'm sorry, in Washington State are African American or people who were born here in the United States. And then that's followed by individuals who are born in Ethiopia, individuals who were born in Kenya. And you can see that in 2009, as I said before, 18 individuals in Washington state who were Somali were living with HIV disease in um, 2009. So although among African-born individuals, Ethiopians and Kenyans bear the, the burden of HIV in the black community here, you can see Zambians, Sudanese, and Somalis also have HIV in their communities. So you might be asking, why is HIV impacting the black community more so than other communities? What is happening in our community that puts us at greater risk? And there are several studies that have been done that show that even when black individuals' behaviors are the same as their white counterparts, they are still at greater risk. So contrary to what some people may believe, it's not that black people are engaging in riskier sex. It's not that black people are doing more drugs or putting themselves at risk more so than other racial or ethnic groups. There are several other factors that play a major role in why HIV is such an issue in our communities. The big issue is that we have a higher disease burden in our community. So what does that mean? As you saw before, we have higher rates of HIV, and not just HIV, other sexually transmitted infections as well. So gonorrhea, chlamydia, and so forth. So we have higher disease levels in our community to begin with. How that happened, you know, I won't go into here, but there, it's there. It, we have higher disease levels. The other factor is that Africans and African Americans, so black people, just like other racial groups, are much more likely to have sexual partners who are other black people. So once a disease comes into our community, it stays in our community because we're you know, having sex with other people who are black in our community. And there's some evidence that shows that black individuals are even more likely to partner with other individuals of their own race than other racial and ethnic groups. So again, once a disease comes into our community, it stays there. And this last point, I think is the most important point. When you look at the way black individuals choose sexual partners, a black individual who is low risk, and I say low risk in quotes because, you know, if you're having sexual activity and you're not protecting yourself and you don't know the status of your partner, that puts everyone at risk. But a low-risk person, so a person who's only had one partner in the past year, is five times more likely than someone in the white community to partner with someone who's considered high risk. So someone who's had five or more partners in the last year. So you've got in the African and African American community individuals who are low risk, who are more likely to partner with someone who's high risk. And they may or may not even know that their partner is high risk. So all of those factors together create these sexual networks that sort of fuel the spread of HIV in the black community. So when we talk about 
sexual networks and how we're all connected, concurrency is a key factor that drives the spread of HIV. So what is concurrency? Basically, concurrency is multiple simultaneous sexual relationships. So what does that mean? Sexual relationships that overlap in time. And why is this important for HIV? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, and before I start talking about why it's important for HIV, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When we talk about HIV, we generally refer to T cells and viral loads. Um, so what are these terms? So T cells, or otherwise known as CD4 cells, are a type of white blood cell that fights infection. And HIV attacks these cells and it uses them to make more copies of HIV. So it basically turns these cells into HIV. And by doing this, HIV weakens the immune system and makes it unable to protect the body from illness and infection. So when you talk about CD4 cells, you want higher levels, and then as the levels get lower, your body is more open to disease and infection. And then the other thing we talk about when we talk about HIV is viral load. And viral load is an important measure of basically the amount of HIV that you have in your blood. So you get your blood drawn and your viral load tells you how much HIV you have in your body, so how active the disease is. So why are these things important? Well, in this graph, this is a graph of someone who is HIV infected and it shows sort of the course of HIV infection in someone who's not taking HIV medications. So the blue line is CD4 count or T cells. Remember those are the cells that HIV attacks. The red line is viral load and remember that's how much virus you have in your body. So you see at the point of HIV infection, you have high T cells, right, because your T cells under, are in, under attack, and you have low viral load. And then once you're infected, your viral load shoots up and your T cells take this major dip because your body has no idea what this foreign agent is, this foreign agent being HIV. So T cells drop viral load raises, and you can see during that three to 12 weeks, this is when someone is highly infectious. So let's say you have a young man who's been dating someone for a year, and they break up with that person, and he's dating around, dating all these different people, one girl, this other girl, and he gets infected. And over the course of those six weeks, he's sleeping with s multiple people, overlapping relationships. And this is the time when he's most highly infectious and can easily, most easily pass on HIV infection. And it's during this time where if you have concurrent relationships, the chances are of spreading the virus to more people is high. So... It's this point that HIV, this is why HIV it loves concurrent relationships because the more people you come in contact and the more people they come in contact, the more HIV potentially spreads in your community. So this is a perfect connection for HIV transmission in the community and that's why that's important. And another thing I should say is let's say that young man uh, has unprotected sex one night during this period and he goes and gets an HIV test the next day because he's concerned that he's HIV infected. Well, the body hasn't built up antibodies yet and that's what an HIV test is testing for. So if you go to get an HIV test, it's going to be negative. It takes about three months for your body to build up antibodies that are going to be picked up by the HIV test and actually show that you are HIV positive. 
So testing regularly is also important uh, in HIV prevention. But in terms of social networks, what's important is how your partners are connected, these overlapping relationships in time, not how many partners one has. So let's illustrate this. So in this slide, person A, the person above, is having serial monogamy. And then person B, in the blue box below, is having concurrent partnerships. So if you look at person A, they have five partners, right? One, two, three, four, five. They have a relationship with the first partner, they end it, have a brief relationship with the second partner, they end it, start with three, four, and so on. In the concurrent partnership, the person has a, part, a steady partner. Partner number one is their steady partner who they are um, you know, possibly married to or their long-term partner. And then they have all of these other partners that overlap in time, still just five partners. So let's say person A, the serial monogamous partner, is infected with HIV with their third partner. Well, as you can see, they've already broken off their relationships with partners one and two. So those partners aren't at risk of getting HIV, right? It's just the partners that come after them that are at risk for HIV infection. But now look at the concurrent partnerships below. If that person is infected by partner number three, he or she takes it back to partner number two because they're still with partner number two and back to partner number one and on to partner number four and five. So more people in the network can become infected through concurrent partnerships. So what is concurrency's impact then on the spread of HIV? Let's say we have 100 people in uh, our community and a quarter of those people are in concurrent relationships. So if you look at the HIV rates at the end of five years, they would be three times as high as if everyone in that population was practicing sequential monogamy. Now let's say half of the people in our population, so 50 out of the 100 are concurrent. HIV rates are 10 times as high after five years. And I think this next slide is a really good illustration of this. So if you look at each one of these little boxes, up above you can see that it shows the population and it shows how many people have one partner, how many people have two partners, and how many people have three partners. So you can see in the first box there, most of the people have one or two partners. So there's about an average of 1.6 partners in the whole population. And you can see how partnerships are connected. Now let's go over to the next box where we've increased the number of partners for a few people to, so that the average number of partners in that population is 1.7. You can see the sexual networks are getting tighter. More people are connected and then you go one over, and we've, we haven't even gotten to everyone in the population having two partners. You can still see that a lot of people only have one partner, some people have two partners, more people have two partners, and then a few people have three partners. And we're tightly connected. Our sexual networks are getting tighter and tighter. And then we move over to the last slide, and you can see that there's a huge impact with just a few people increasing their partners to two. And the point here is that a little concurrency has a huge impact on the spread of infection in a population. The flip side of that is not everyone has to change their behavior. Just a few people have to realize how they're putting their partner and their community at risk and change the behavior to have a major impact on HIV transmission. So the point of concurrency is one partner at a time. And we've been out in the streets and we've talked to many um, Somali residents and, uh, of Seattle and King County and many Somali individuals have told us you know, that 
practicing polygamy is part of their culture and it's a tradition that many individuals practice and w we understand that we're not saying anything negative about polygamy we're saying that if you are having overlapping partnerships then you have to make sure that you're not only protecting yourself but you're protecting your partners because whatever you bring into your sexual network is going to spread to the entire network whatever one of your partners brings in to the sexual network spreads to everyone so um, concurrency is about one partner at a time but in situations where you don't have one partner at a time making sure that everyone is safe getting tested and making sure everyone is HIV negative and making sure you're not bringing anything into your sexual network is important for your own protection, the protection of your partners and the protection of your community. So I thank you so much for your time. You will see us around in your neighborhood uh, talking about concurrency and you'll also see these, this, uh, poster and palm cards in Somali businesses and restaurants and on the street. And if you see any of us out there, we would love to talk to you about the campaign. If you have any questions about the campaign, you can go to the website uh, that's on the card there. It's called www.stopconcurrency.org. Uh, we were hoping to have the website in multiple languages. Unfortunately, it is only in English. Um, but if you have any questions that you would like to follow up on, you can feel free to call our offices. The number is 206-685-4498. Again, 206-685-4498. So thank you so much for having me on Somali TV. And please protect yourself protect your partners and protect your community because HIV is an issue here in King County and it disproportionately impacts black individuals. So thank you very much.